Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer has accused Boris Johnson of having checked out and of, uh, of failing to do the basics to prepare the country for the current heatwave. Labour have set out their plan for what they say would make a more resilient Britain in the face of national emergencies. We're joined now by the Shadow Secretary for Climate Change, uh, Ed Miliband. A very good morning to you. Without your tie... Good morning. ..with good reason, I should imagine, on a morning like this. Yeah, indeed, it's, a, it's been a sweaty day, hasn't it? Sweaty day and a sweaty night. Um, look, it is a very... <laughs> um, it's a very serious... It's a very serious situation. And I suppose the first thing to say is... We think of this as unusual, and it is unusual in, in the history of our country, but it's going to increasingly going to become the new normal. You know, the, the, the world as a whole is hotter than it's been for 125,000 years, and we're going to see more of this. And, and overall, we've seen global warming of about one degree centigrade on average. That's on average compared to the pre-industrial era. And, but the trouble is that we, we know we're going to go beyond that one degree, and so we're going to see a lot more of, of this kind of heat, this kind of extreme weather. Mm. And frankly, we aren't pro we're neither prepared as a country for that, nor are we doing what we should to go all in on tackling the climate emergency, which I think is the biggest single yeah. threat we face. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because, um, you know, there's lots of comment pieces in the papers. Lots of our viewers are getting in touch saying, listen, you know, we're British people are resilient, says Peter on Twitter. We'll make it through a couple of warm days. We've survived other extreme weather events and cope with it just fine. You know, other opinion pieces saying, you know, the media is hysterical about it, the Met Office is going too far and telling us that we need to change our behaviour. But I think there's a difference here, isn't there, between how we cope as individuals over the next couple of days versus whether, as the National Security Strategy Committee have, have said, there's a hole in how we are prepared as infrastructure. Because it's fine to deal with it for a couple of days, but it's about how the trains will run, how the tarmac at our airports will not melt in the future. There's an enormous amount of work, yet outstanding. Why is it that even though we've had these warnings for so long, that we as a country are still woefully underprepared? But because the government's ignored them, frankly. You know, look, I brought in the Climate Change Act in 2008, and for the first time, we brought in, we legislated for a climate change risk assessment. There have been three of those uh, since this government's been in power. And frankly, and the, the people who run this uh, risk assessment have said, we've just been had our repeated warnings ignored. Let me give you some examples. We don't have a maximum workplace temperature to keep workers safe. We've got no guidelines on existing homes and how they should be made fit for purpose. The, you talk about infrastructure and the resilience of our infrastructure, and you're completely right about that. Do you know that the reporting on whether our, our infrastructure is resilient is actually voluntary? We, the, the operators of, of the train tracks and so on don't actually have to do that. It's a voluntary process. Now, that is just not good enough. And, and we've got to wake up and understand the scale of what's necessary. That is why we'd have a new climate change resilience, uh, 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 national resilience uh, committee in government to look at this. But also, this, this area of adaptation to climate change has got to stop being the orphan of government. There are a few people in DEFRA, the Department of uh, Environment, that... Uh, that work on this, and frankly, it isn't enough, it, it isn't serious, and we're not serious as a country about it. It felt as though um, 10, 12 years ago that there was a consensus forming in our country across politics about the importance of tackling climate change. Is that consensus still in place, or does the current leadership debate in the Conservative Party suggest that that consensus is fracturing? You're completely right, Ed, and I, I really fear what we're seeing in the Conservative Party leadership race, because at the moment when we are facing the most extreme heat wave we've potentially ever faced as a country, when we know we've got to tackle this emergency, when we know we've got to wake up to the challenge, you would have thought that people who are standing to be the prime minister of the country would be running towards this issue and saying, we've got to act, we've got to tackle it. Instead, they are falling over each other to run away from it. You even got one of the candidates saying this is unilateral economic disarmament tackling the climate emergency. She is completely wrong. It is national economic leadership to tackle this emergency, not just because it will keep people safe, but because it can also help us tackle the cost of living crisis, because renewable energy is now the cheapest form of power that we have, and it can also create millions of good jobs across our country. So I think you're right, Ed, there is a 
new big divide yep. in politics on this issue. And as for Labour, we will put this at the centre of our election offer, including with our pledge of £28 billion investment in the good green jobs of the future. A quick question about um, the cost of living. Today it looks like the government is going to say that public pay settlements should be half the level of inflation, around 5% when inflation is closer to 10. Is that fair? I I'm really worried about that, Ed, actually. You know, what we see at the moment is that private sector pay settlements are running at 8% and public sector settlements are running at 1.5%. I mean, you know, that is our massive gulf. And I think what's happening again, and we've seen this over the last decade, is often low-paid workers in the public sector are being made to, to pay for an economic crisis. It's not this economic situation, this cost of living crisis, it's not, it's not caused by workers, it's caused by what's happening to energy prices, food prices, and so on. So would Labour got... borrow more money we, in we order got... to pay for an increase in public sector pay to we keep would... up with I, inflation? Because that is obviously, yeah. we saw from the, you know, the Tory leadership contest, and they are all in consensus about that, in that well, we would... they don't agree with giving the workers the pay that keeps up with inflation because they say the country can't afford it. Well, look, we would have a fair settlement, and I'm not going to pluck figures out of the air, but let me just say this. How will we judge what the government comes forward with today? How does it compare to what's actually happening to inflation, and is it fair? Crucially, is it fair to low-paid workers? Because we often talk about this in a sort of general sense about pay, but what you're actually seeing is pay at the top going up quite a lot and pay at the bottom not, not uh, going up. Uh, so is it fair to low-paid workers? And thirdly, and you talk about costs, one of the biggest costs we can face is if our NHS can't recruit staff, if our care homes can't re recruit staff. So, so let's look at what... If our schools can't recruit teachers, so let's look at what this will mean for recruitment. This does pose a dilemma, though, doesn't it, uh, Ed, for Keir Starmer, because he's had um, a, a spokesman for the party supporting strikes, he's had PPSs on picket lines. We had Lisa Nanda yesterday who said she wouldn't join a picket line but she did support the, um, the action which is being proposed in the rail industry. When you were Labour leader before 2015, that wasn't the approach you took. You were much more inclined to say that you would be an honest broker rather than supporting strikes. Is it a different approach the Labour leader is taking now and uh, does that reflect different times we're in? It's a good question. I, look, I think it's reflecting the reality that you've got an appalling cost of living crisis happening, Ed. And, you know, we, we, we haven't... The Tory leadership contest hasn't talked about this much. We've got but very much, but potentially energy bills of £3,200 coming this autumn. And you've got people... And, and then you've got an accumulation of a decade of pressure on workers. And so I think Keir Starmer, Lisa and Andy are right to say we shouldn't condemn workers who are taking action. Now, it's not our job to join picket lines, but it is, but it is our job to, to stand up for workers who are under massive pressure. Now, we don't want to see strikes go ahead, but there is a massive responsibility on government to make sure that what they're offering in terms of the public sector is fair and to make sure they get round the table and try and sort these problems out. There's a different approach to the approach Tony Blair, Gordon Brown and you took when you were Labour leader? I'm not sure it is actually that different. I mean, we, we tried to judge, and you were alongside me, we tried to judge different disputes in different ways. But, I look, I certainly think what is true is that the accumulation of austerity and the pressure on wages and the pressure on workers is something you have to hear loud and clear. Ed Miliband, thank you so much for joining us on the show.